Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Luke Wentland. I'm a principal R&D engineer here at Plug Power and I'm sitting down with my friend Jack Brower. Hi, my name is Jack Brower. I'm a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at the University of California, Irvine. I direct the Clean Energy Institute there and we study hydrogen and related technologies. Awesome. So Jack, there's a lot of discussion and exciting news and things happening within the hydrogen economy. You can't read an article in yeah. a newspaper every, any day without seeing something going on, but a lot of discussion has been about the Inflation Reduction Act mm -hmm. and the production tax credit for hydrogen. Yeah. Can you explain that a little bit and what it is and what's going on? Yeah, uh, Congress passed in the Inflation Reduction Act a production tax credit for hydrogen. And the intention there was that they wanted to provide support for especially low carbon and low emissions hydrogen production. So they provided $3 per kilogram for those technologies that could achieve really, really low carbon intensity. And they provided a dollar per kilogram of support for those that got somewhat lower carbon intensity. Okay. Yeah. So wh why? I mean, that, that's great that they yeah. put this program together, but what's, what's the intent of doing something like that? Yeah, so we know that after we begin to install solar, wind, nuclear, and other zero carbon technologies, we need to support them with other technologies like batteries or energy storage. And we've already invested a lot in those technologies, and they knew that next we need to invest in hydrogen fuel cells and electrolyzers. These are the technologies that can do certain things that none of those other technologies can do to achieve zero emissions economy wide. Okay, this is super important because if we don't invest in hydrogen fuel cells and electrolyzers, we can't decarbonize and depollute everything. We can only do some right. decarbonization, some depollution. So, just like we supported through policies in California, all throughout the United States and around the world that incentivized the installation of solar, incentivized the installation of wind, incentivized batteries and battery electric vehicles. We also need to, in the early market, incentivize hydrogen and related technologies. So you're seeing early market. Yeah. So, I mean, is that kind of where you view this clean hydrogen world at right now? Yeah, certainly we've invested way more in sun, wind power, and batteries than we have in the hydrogen space up sure. to this time. And we didn't really need hydrogen in the early years because we only had small amounts of sun and wind power. We didn't need to store a lot. We didn't need to store it for a long time. We didn't need to get that sun and wind power into things like ships and difficult applications, applications that are challenging to actually get renewable electricity into. Now that we're starting to do those things, and now that we need the features of hydrogen, we must invest in the initial implementation and scale up of that technology. So before we get to scale up, let me yeah. ask you, you're, you're talking about some hard to decarbonize industries. I mean, yeah. you, you mentioned ocean going vessels yeah. maybe, but like yeah. what, what more is there than, I mean, what yeah. else, where else can you do with it? Okay, so hydrogen has very special features that are required by some industry applications, right? So you have things like steel, or ammonia production. Right. You need the reducing gas feature. That's something, a chemical that has to react with the iron ore to actually make iron. Yeah. You need a chemical like the H2 itself to make the NH3, which is the ammonia for fertilizer and other applications. Um, you have other difficult applications in industry that require things like high temperature heat. So if it requires really high temperatures, it's very difficult to make that work with electricity. Right. Uh, besides the fact that it can be done at lower cost by delivering a fuel than it can, because electricity is more expensive usually than fuel. You also have other features that hydrogen will provide, like long duration storage. Uh, batteries are good for short duration storage, that's what we use our cell phones and everything, but we have to charge them every night, okay. Um, but once you have storage that you need from like January to June, then hydrogen becomes more efficient, okay, and a cheaper way to store things for a long time. Okay, right. long time. Secondly, massive storage that we need for a grid that, use, that needs uh, sun and wind power from a certain season to be transferred all the way to another season. That means we have a massive amount of storage that we need for a renewable grid. 
And that can only be done by something that has separate power and energy scaling. What do I mean by that? We can size the electrolyzer for power in amount, the fuel cell for the power out amount, and we can make the tank in between as big as we want. Yeah. All independent. Batteries don't scale that way. Okay, so you're starting to see the difficult things for what we currently um, have solutions for, okay, those that are difficult, we can do with hydrogen. Okay, and these are just some of the applications where hydrogen um, it will be needed for our zero emissions yeah. future. So yeah. talk to me about scale. I mean, you, we yeah. you just hit like, you know, a really broad <laughs> range of, of applications yeah. there. Yeah. Um, maybe pick out a couple, like let's, let's say ammonia, steel, yeah. like, let's say big power, you know, on the grid, whether yeah. it's Fermi or, or whatever, you know, just exactly how much hydrogen are you talking when you, when you talk about decarbonizing those? Well, uh, currently today, we move most of our energy around in society via molecules. So in other words, only about 20% of our energy is moved around as electrons. Mm -hmm. The rest of it, 80% around the world, okay, is moved in the form of molecules. Most of it is petroleum, but it's also natural gas and it's coal. Mm -hmm. Okay, those three things carry 80% of our total energy around the world. And we don't want to use any of these in our ultimate zero emissions future, besides the fact that these are all finite, they're not going to last forever, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so what I expect actually though, is for the amount of energy we move around in society as electrons to grow. And it's going to take over some of those things that we used for coal and natural gas and petroleum, okay? But around half, literally half, of the energy that we move around in society has to be in the form of a molecule. Right. Okay, so what, what I suspect is that that's not all gonna be hydrogen. Some of it's gonna be some other molecules. Okay, sure. renewable molecules. Uh, some of it's going to be done with um, uh, even ammonia and these, and these other things. But they are gonna start mostly from hydrogen. So I would suggest that about 20 to 25% of our total energy that we move around all around the world is gonna be hydrogen. So what you're saying is, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. billions of kilograms of hydrogen oh, yes. are going to be needed. Yes. We're talking order of magnitude 500 billion just for the U.S. And so was this what went through the mind of Congress when they, they were putting together the IRA and the PTC? Is, I think you, so. You said scale up, right? Yes. That's, that's what they're getting at. Yeah. You need to scale to reach those industries? Yes. Not only do you need to um, uh, scale for reducing the price, Right. Uh, but you also need that massive amount to actually right. meet the demands, right. Right? right? That the future portends. So when, when, from a timing, do you, do I guess, do you or some of these other groups that look at this kind of stuff see that scale being needed for clean yes. and green hydrogen? So, um, 2030, 2035. Okay. 24, I know. I don't want to pin you down. No, no, no. But, 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 but the the, um, the scale up has to begin today. Right. From my perspective. Right. As a matter of fact, I thought it should have begun <laughs> much sooner than this. I Bro, yeah, right. I thought it should have begun much, much sooner than this. But we had administrations that weren't adopting a hydrogen policy sure. until this one, really. Sure. That's this um, serious about investing in the hydrogen future. So what I think, though, is that the initial investments have to happen immediately. This is why I think the PTC should be uh, implemented, as Congress desired, in this next year. Okay, and start funding these production, this production of clean hydrogen now. Okay, because we we still have to build up the manufacturing base. Yes. We have to build up uh, the infrastructure that's going to actually transport the hydrogen, and then the infrastructure that's going to use the hydrogen. And this is a long process. You know, it's like anything in the energy business. You need not only the the production of it, but you also need to move it around, and then you need to actually put it to the end yeah. use. Okay, and all of this infrastructure takes a while to build. So I expect that initial investments that are made today will cause a scale to happen in a decade. So in other words, by 2030, 2035 or so, okay, we should have low cost hydrogen for some applications already there, right? And then it's gonna start to um, have massive investment, not from the government, but from industry, because they're gonna demand this zero emissions, yeah. now low cost fuel. And then some of the applications are gonna take a little bit longer because they need hydrogen to get even cheaper than we're gonna be able to do in 2035. Okay, so again, you can see how it just builds on itself after 
the initial investment of the PTC. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. So, I mean, I, with anything, the government wants to fund or give incentives or yes. breaks for, right? There's a lot of discussion about should they or shouldn't they do it or how yeah. should they do it. I think there's been a lot of discussion about some potential rules and regulations yeah. that, that people have been proposing putting in place. I think the uh, an additionality and hourly time matching and a regionality requirement yeah. that, that companies would have to meet in order to be eligible for the PTC. Yeah. What's, what's your take on that, I guess? I'd be curious yeah. you know, from, from your, <laughs> your side of the world. Yeah, so um, I think that it is a good idea to be concerned about uh, where the primary energy is coming from. Okay, so when we make renewable hydrogen via electrolysis, we would like it to be made from solar, wind, or nuclear power that have zero carbon emissions. Okay, so that's what we want. And those are the only kinds of things that are going to qualify for $3 anyway, right? Because they're the ones that have zero carbon, zero pollution, pollution too, okay? So, um, and, uh, and we can uh, make sure that's the case through lots of different mechanisms. One of them is, for example, to use already curtailed electricity that exists in California or in many jurisdictions around. Or, um, solar and wind power that's available at negative prices, okay, already in certain markets. And this is because those markets have already naturally built a lot of sun and wind power. And they did so without any additional additionality constraint. With incentives that said, we want, you, we want to put a, a value on the produ produced electricity. And when that value on the produced electricity was put there, it became cost effective and people adopted even more than they thought. Okay, the same will happen with hydrogen without an additionality constraint, without forcing hydrogen to use a new sun resource or a new wind resource, it will put a demand on the market that will put new solar and new wind out there anyway. Right. Okay, so it'll, it'll naturally do that. And as a matter of fact, we're working on a paper right now um, <laughs> that studies how the uh, incentives were put in place for sun and wind power, and um, whether or not there was any additionality constraint applied, and there wasn't, okay, and how effective were they at introducing the amount of sun and wind power that they desired. And as a matter of fact, without any additionality constraints, they put more than they had to. Wow. Okay, so um, additionality constraints are not required to actually get the goal of more sun and wind power out there, Interesting. okay, for the electrolysis, okay. Um, secondly, um, any time constraint was also not applied to sun and wind power, right? So you can actually buy sun or wind power at any hour of the day and use it at other hours of the day, um, and uh, and this has not uh, led to people. Um, uh, not installing sun or, sun or wind power, or not installing enough sun or wind power, they still have to actually produce it at any given time of day. And the only thing that is different is if the carbon intensity of the grid at the time you produce it is different than, than the carbon intensity of the grid at the time that you use it, is the only time that there's a difference between um, the time-based and the non-time-based uh, renewable energy. Because you're gonna produce the renewable energy, that's for sure. Yeah. If you use it at a different time, it only makes a difference if the grid is different. And what's happening already on the grid? For example, in California, <laughs> the grid is already getting more and more clean at every hour of the day. Yeah. And as that continues to happen, there's no need to add time stamping to make sure that happens because that we're already under a constraint to be 100% renewable by 2045. Well, it's gonna happen, yeah. okay? That happens. Uh, that is assisted by investing in hydrogen because it offers another vector for uh, using that sun and wind power and, and, and using it and uh, producing the hydrogen from the sun and wind power at certain hours and using it at other hours. Yeah. Okay, so it actually helps with regard to the time. Yeah. Okay, what's the final constraint? It's regionality. Um, and this means that um, you want to make sure that if you produce a, a unit of sun and wind energy um, in a certain place, that there's actually a way that you could deliver that to the end user. Um, and again, hydrogen isn't something that impedes that, it's actually something that helps that. 
because it offers another vector for using that renewable electricity through a pipeline instead of a wire, okay, and relieves some of the transmission constraints of the electric grid. Yeah. Okay, so you see um, the, um, the regionality constraint is actually uh, not necessary either. Um, if you look at what is constraining solar power in California today, it's because we don't have enough transmission. If you put in an electrolyzer here, you can transmit it uh, yeah. via the pipe yeah, yeah. instead of the wire. Yeah. Okay. okay, so from my perspective, none of these constraints, even though they are interesting ideas technically and that we need in the very far future, 20 years from now, we are going to have regionality, we're going to have time-based uh, renewable energy, and we're going to have uh, the um, connections to all of that sun and wind able to deliver it to the end uses. Okay. So it sounds like what you're saying, though, is that in the near term, it's going to be more of a, like, a market-driven approach. You don't, you don't need to, the government doesn't need to impose these type of rules because the market's going to drive, kind of drive it naturally to occur. And that, that's what happened with solar and wind already, right? I think that's the whole um, intention of any kind of incentive, <laughs> right? If you have a production tax credit, it's to say, let's use the efficiency of the market yeah. to actually yeah. enable this with an incentive. Yeah, okay. Right? That's exactly it. So yeah. let me ask you that, though. What would be... Let, you know, let, let's, let's play a doomsday scenario. Yeah. What, if, if some of these proposals that have been getting discussed get put in place, in your opinion, what, what would be the impact of those, hmm. those policies? Well, certainly um, there will be less investment and there will be a slower scale up of hydrogen technology. There will be less solar and wind power installed, period. Right. Because they're constrained already in many markets, mm -hmm. right? And if you don't allow some other vector like these electrolyzers and pipes to deliver it to end uses, that also couldn't be decarbonized otherwise. So if, uh, if you want to, for example, uh, make electricity go to an ammonia plant and get rid of the natural gas, that's impossible. But if you use an electrolyzer to take sun and wind power and convert it to hydrogen, you can now put that renewable energy into the ammonia plant. Right. Okay, so there's going to be less sun and wind power, there's going to be less scale up and later scale up of any hydrogen and its positive features. Wow. And I mean, kind of to our earlier discussion point, though, you said that there needs to be a ramp up right now for some of these other harder, you know, to decarbonize. Industries. Oh, yes. Yes. If you look at what, for example, we have been doing so far in, in California, is we've made our electric grid about 50% decarbonized. And we've done that through a combination of things, hydro, nuclear, sun, wind power, and batteries. Okay, so we're about 50% decarbonized. In the electric grid, how much are we decarbonized in heavy duty trucking in California? Oh gosh, I don't know, not much. <laughs> Less than 0.1%. Oh. Okay. Wow. Uh, we have like 10 demonstration projects. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's like tiny. And, and this, is, this is why it's so important that we actually invest in hydrogen now, because we need to get rid of the more difficult to decarbonize applications, right. like the diesel applications in ships, the long haul trucks, and all the stuff that's in the ports and in these transportation corridors, you know, and things like that. These freight applications, that's, that's one example. How about heavy industry? Also, 0% decarbonization, right. right? So these things that need to be decarbonized at, and that we haven't yet started to decarbonize, that's what this PTC will start to enable. Wow. Yeah. Well, Jack, <laughs> hey, this was a great conversation. Yeah, I really appreciate you. you taking the time. Thank um, you very much. Really nice to be with you. Yeah. Thanks.